Awesome. Thank you, Anthony. Okay. There's a message on the screen. You may have to accept. All right, so I'll talk about um, uh, our design to development pipeline and then we'll do questions later. So uh, first off, why do we use Figma? Is everyone kind of familiar with the tool? I see like tiny people on the screen, but uh, if you can give some feedback, auditory feedback, that would be helpful. Um, if you're not, it's a design tool. Um, uh, people in the past have used XD um, or Photoshop to create mockups and designs to kind of hand off to developers in the past. Figma has gained uh, quite a bit of popularity um, and it's becoming a very like common and popular tool for um, the design to development uh, handoff. But it can it can do much more. So let's talk about why we um, or how it came to our lives. Um, so uh, before I started working at UCLA, um, there was already a redesign project um, that was ongoing. Um, and the vendor used Figma as a, a means to deliver the um, redesigns, um, the page mockups, they created a pattern library. And uh, it included some, some high fidelity page components, uh, page comps. Um, and it was their, their way to communicate to stakeholders um, generally. They tried to use it as also a tool to communicate to developers, um, but uh, it wasn't, uh, that wasn't their primary audience. I, I don't think it's as, uh, as the case. Um, and uh, so as uh, a new UX developer in a very new UX team that was uh, set up by Josh, um, we were, very eager to play with uh, the tool to see kind of where um, its limits were and see what we can do and kind of make it more developer friendly and ease the um, designer to developer handoff. Um, yeah, so how do we use Figma? It's kind of evolved through uh, the almost two years that um, I've been here. But uh, we, we definitely use it for um, communication and uh, clarity. So we um, uh, use, use it as our design tool. We um, communicate our designs to stakeholders through the page comps. We um, have uh, switched it up from a pattern library to a more robust design system. And I'll talk a little bit more about what a design system is. Um, uh, and just to clarify, uh, so we've taken like all the different parts of um, the designs that the vendor provided and tried to think of them as tiny little components that are re reusable. And then even further, we take those components and take the little pieces that are reusable out of those um, so that we have uh, consistency in the design, but also in the implementation um, as, as well. It, it also serves as uh, internal documentation for us. There's like annotations that we um, uh, write for ourselves as designers, but also for the developers to help guide um, the build process. Um, and uh, speaking of like breaking things down into the little pieces. So uh, we've got like a page comp, it has many different components. And then in each of those components, there are little um, little bits and pieces of uh, uh, design artifacts that are um, going to be referred to in this talk as design tokens. And it's a fairly common um, and acceptable term now. W3C is has a working group to kind of standardize the concept of design tokens as well. So um, design tokens, what are they? Uh, they're named entities that store raw, indivisible design values like colors uh, or pixel sizes. Um, they're core pieces of a design system. So they're stored in a technology agnostic format and they can be transformed for use on any platform replacing hard coded values. So think of like a hex, uh, a hex code for a color instead of um, having to go into your app uh, and change that hex code many times over and copy and paste it many times over, sometimes mistakenly doing the wrong one, um, uh, uh, we try to refer to that particular color as a specific token. And um, so in, 
in uh, Figma, there is a plugin called Token Studio, and um, it helps us manage the, uh, the brand uh, and the design tokens in, um, at scale. So um, what it does is it captures design tokens as JSON. So that's the, the platform agnostic layer. And um, we also associate design tokens um, through this plugin as part of a component. So then we can change a token and it will impact the, the design of that component as well. Um, and this plugin also uh, helps us version control um, the, the design tokens through GitHub integration. Uh, and there are some shortcomings, uh, but we have workarounds. So um, I was playing with the tokens plugin this morning, but there are some uh, bugs that are existing. So I'm just going to, so this is, I'll walk you through how we have our uh, design system set up. So this is our, our design system we have I'm going to close it so you can see. So we have all these different components um, in their own separate pages so that we can kind of isolate. You can see there's annotations for the developers. I'll zoom in so you can see. Um, there's information about like which, which tokens to use, the colors, what variables we're referring to them as. Um, so there's and there, there's examples of how they are used uh, within the page as well. So um, this is how we have our components set up. And when I open up the um, Token Studio plugin, you can see that there are these different uh, token sets. And um, we save our spacing tokens here so that we have consistent spacing throughout our designs. Um, there's white space uh, spacing, there's containers, so we have our breakpoints uh, live here as well. Uh, there's colors so that we don't have a million versions of like slight differences in blue, so that these are all the colors that are used. Um, some border radius, there's all these different little properties that we can um, store as, as data that can then be used uh, in, in the development. But um, like I said, there were some shortcomings. So uh, we had to create different sets to kind of isolate certain aspects of the tokens um, because we do want all of these tokens to be uh, uh, saved in, in GitHub and version controlled. But um, we don't, so like as an example for typography and for spacing, we use um, uh, SAS to calculate the math because we use uh, fluid typography as well as fluid spacing for our um, our websites. Um, so we want those to kind of be excluded, but also included. Um, and I'll kind of explain more what that means later. There's also uh, some shortcomings with certain properties like box shadow. Um, uh, I'll go further uh, into it later when uh, I talk about our GitHub Actions workflow, but this, uh, the way that box shadows are handled um, as the, the JSON, it doesn't get transformed correctly um, as something that's usable for developers. So we've kind of separated those as, uh, as part of this exclude set. So let's go back in here. Um, yeah, but there's workarounds. So uh, I'll talk about what we do there. So all of this goes into GitHub as, um, as a, a repository as JSON. So let's go back in here. So over here, I can pull or push to GitHub. There's, we're just uh, pushing to the main branch um, uh, or pulling from the main branch. What we do is we create a new branch whenever we're working with um, any changes to the token set because we do want to be able to like review any changes that happen and make sure that there are no accidents. So you can see that there's a, a test tokens branch here that um, we're working on. And then we can push it um, and it exists in GitHub. So this is our repository um, and that the data gets saved to. So let's go in here. So this is what, um, if this is too small, let me know. So this is what 
this Figma tokens, the token studio plugin provides us. It gives us um, a token set. This is the global token set and all these different tokens with the values, the type, the description, um, all this information that comes from Figma, which um, is a great place to kind of um, determine that like, this is the single source of design truth. Uh, and we also want that to be, the goal is for that to be the, the single source of the development truth as well. So um, I'll take you to the, through the workflow of what we need do to kind of get that going. All right, so uh, we version control the, the design tokens as JSON. Um, and then we kind of do more than what this plugin provides. So we store icons and typefaces. So we've got our SVGs in here. Um, we don't like, uh, like, I think before we had this set up, the developers had to go into Figma and get an export of each asset. Um, so any SVG that they needed for the development, the implementation, they had to kind of get themselves or they would ask us to get it themselves. Um, and that was not, uh, I, I did not think that was the best way to do it. It was kind of confusing um, because there are various uh, export options in Figma as well. And um, it didn't produce uh, consistent SVGs. So I'll go into one of these and see. How do I, there you go. Okay, so in here, um, what we've done is we've saved all our SVG. So we do, the designers do the exporting. We um, add it to this repository. And um, before we do that, we, we alter the each individual SVG that we export so that they have consistent class names, um, a consistent namespace as well. This way we can kind of alter the, um, the various strokes and uh, colors um, give it like so as an example, sometimes when uh, this icon is used on a light background, certain strokes have a darker color and if it's on a darker background, the stroke colors change so that it um, has the appropriate contrast and it's actually visible. So uh, we, we follow this naming convention to easily do that. So all our SVGs are saved in here. That is something outside of the, the, the plugin, but it's something that we thought would be useful um, to save as a token. Uh, we, we kind of see icons or assets as a token as well. But let's see, we also include a reset. So that is in here. There's all of these different um, SAS partials to kind of help uh, facilitate development as well. So there's a reset here. It's crawling. Okay, and we use uh, Andy Bell's modern reset just because it's the simplest, um, but kind of, kind of covers the gamut. Um, so that's in there. We supply SAS helpers as mixins. So that is in here. So for box shadows um, and overlays, uh, what a default link looks like, like all the developers have to do in the component is just do at include link dash default and all of these properties are kind of included. So um, the styling is very consistent and um, uh, the developer experience is also like a very, um, uh, it's a lower effort and like definitely lower mental load and the developers can speak uh, um, and kind of give feedback on that later. So there's, there's different styling that, um, that kind of groups the properties together. So some accessible um, uh, visual hiding of elements. So say that we want to visually hide an element, but make it still available for screen readers to access. The developers just have to do at include visually hidden and um, it's included. There's also um, a minimum clickable area to make sure that target size is, is the, uh, uh, the minimal that we're expecting. Um, and then here are our typography um, mixins as well, and some helpers for truncation, buttons, placeholders, things like that. 
Um, and it does some math. So SAS is a very powerful um, language that we're using to kind of help us create better CSS. And we do fluid typography, like I said before. So we're using SAS math to kind of figure out, um, to calculate the, um, the magic of uh, fluid typography through the, the calc uh, functions. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks really complicated, uh, but it, it produces magic. Um, uh, so as you resize the type size uh, adjusts to be like um, as optimally readable as possible. There's also spacing. We're also using math to create fluid um, spacing as well. And those are very similar um, uh, formulas there. And let's see, yeah, so we do lots of SAS, but we also uh, use a lot of um, CSS custom properties or CSS variables. So uh, what we do with, um, with this is we, we have a bunch of actions that kind of compile all the different um, uh, partials together. So for um, a global uh, app or an app that has a, a global styling that we want applied, we want to in include certain um, certain SAS partials in there. And let's see, in here, in the assets, you could see, um, this is minified, so it's all one line, but let's see. You can see that we're using CSS, um, like anything with a dash dash. So we can see, you can see that there's, it's just a bunch of CSS variables that are um, the output of this. Uh, and I'm talking about the output, but I haven't kind of told you how we do it. So we do it through a bunch of dip, different Git, GitHub actions. Okay, and this is where the magic happens. Um, so there's a bunch of actions. Let's go back to GitHub and Go to the code. Um, and uh, so uh, a, a lot of this uh, came out of a, um, uh, a learning day where um, Josh gives us uh, a day. Um, now it's Mondays, it used to be Fridays, where we just devote our day into learning. So um, all of this was like kind of uh, explored and figured out during those kinds of days. So very, very helpful and grateful of, of those that time. Um, so let's go into this first action. So what we do here, and is this visible enough? Yes, yes. Okay, so let's get rid of this. Um, so over here, we update our tokens and uh, compile some CSS. So, um, Every time a uh, branch is like we're ignoring the main branch because we want to um, uh, just focus whenever a new branch is pushed, um, a new commit is pushed to a new branch um, that this action runs. So we've got some steps here. What we need to do is we first uh, transform the tokens that the JSON that comes out of this plugin, this token studio um, plugin is not initially workable um, with a tool called Style Dictionary. Style Dictionary is a tool that um, is something that uh, Amazon created and uh, uses. Um, what they do, what this tool does is it transforms JSON into um, uh, the SAS, uh, CSS, uh, JavaScript, if you want, or other um, other platform specific um, uh, languages so that these styles can be used in whatever app um, setting that you, you have. But um, so before we can use the JSON that the plugin from Figma um, uh, comes, comes with, what we need to do is transform that JSON to something that style dictionary can use so that we can eventually get that SAS or CSS that we're looking for. So first we transform those tokens into something usable, a usable JSON, and then we um, convert those tokens according to a config in style dictionary. So let's open that up. Okay, um, so 
All right, so this is our um, very simple config. Uh, what we, we tell it to do is just to, um, that we, we want uh, SCSS, that's our, our preferred format, and that um, we want the tokens that were transformed to, um, to become this partial, this token to our partial. So that again gets created here. So then uh, now we have some, some SAS that is usable, some SAS variables. Um, but uh, again, we kind of wanted to go uh, even deeper than that. So that's the extent to which uh, style dictionary goes. Um, but after that, we, uh, we want to make sure that like the, the new tokens that are generated are included in the commit. Let's see. Uh, we also want to create um, a global CSS file. So this assets directory. Is um, created by that by that action as well. This um, this file because uh, we are using this in um, uh, a Spring Share uh, tool as well. We're using this in LibWizard uh, for now, but hopefully more Spring Share um, tools as well in the future. Um, we're also using it in a View app. Uh, Paranita will talk about the component library. That's that heavily uses this. Um, and yeah, so there's CSS that gets compiled through the SAS uh, from, from this uh, action as well. And then there's the publishing. So let's go back here in case I missed something. So there's um, token transformer that goes from the JSON that comes from Figma into a usable JSON that then style dictionary can turn into SAS or CSS. Um, and then we do semantic releases. So you will notice that um, our commits are prefixed um, with uh, feet. If it's a feature, there's chore in there. Let's go in here. Um, yeah, so chores, fixes, features, um, those are generally what we use. But based off of the prefix, um, what happens is that there is a semantic, uh, semantic release uh, tool that helps us create um, or automate the release and, and package uh, publishing process. So the 550 is determined by the prefixes. Like we don't touch release numbers. We go back in here. So, um, so we also want to, um, so it's great that like we have access to CSS variables. It's great that we have access to um, SAS variables as well, right? But it's, um, it would be even better if we could create a package, uh, an NPM package so that the developers can just install it in their app and um, have all of, of that. Uh, all of the SVGs, all of the SAS variables, all of the CSS variables um, to, to be consumed. So what we've got here, here's the semantic release um, tool in action. And then we're, we're also, um, so this is for the uh, uh, tools like um, LibWizard for SpringShare, where we have a separate repository called Hosted Assets, where um, uh, these third-party tools kind of pull these assets from. Um, yeah, what else? So then we publish to NPM and yeah, and then the, um, the devs kind of take, take it over in their component library. Um, yeah, so how do we use the NPM? So we add uh, the published package to, so this is the component library um, repository. We add the package to, um, where are you package JSON? Okay, so there we go. Um, we, that's it, that's, we add the package. It's a little behind. We can update that. 
Um, and then this is kind of it in use. We also have to add it to the view config. Um, we use Storybook, so we want uh, to, to have the tokens included in there too. Um, and this is a, um, a component, a block date component using um, the SVG from pulling the SVG from that token repository. So there's no copying images and putting it in a certain folder. It kind of just gets sucked, like sucked in, uh, slurped in through this, through this uh, package. Here's another repository using the um, SVGs. And then there's a uh, rollup config. It took a while to figure that out. Um, it was a little tricky, but uh, yeah, that's that's how we're building the components. And Barry will probably talk about that. So um, yeah, this is it in use. Uh, so let's see if we can find. Let me just pick a random component, maybe. Okay, just to see like the CSS variables. So like gradients um, are in there. You don't have to think about it. And we're using a variety of like using the CSS custom properties or CSS variables as well as the SAS um, way of doing things. Uh, so it gives us a, a few different options. Um, there are still some some hard coded numbers in there. So uh, in the future, I would like to kind of just move away from that, but um, understand that sometimes not everything is uh, can be a systematic decision. So that's it in use. And then um, we also add the package to our Nuxt app. So that's the library website um, uses Nuxt to kind of create uh, the static site. So we include it in the config as well as, um, uh, as a package and uh, everything kind of just works. Um, and yeah, so what, why do this? Why, what problem does this solve? Um, so with design tokens, uh, the handoff and like any global changes kind of get easier. If we set it up correctly, um, a design token can be changed um, and in one place only. So like, if we decide to not use blue anymore, UCLA needs to use purple. That is the color of UCLA. We just go into Figma, change the design token, and then um, the GitHub action releases a new package with all uh, the, new, the new token value. And then the developers just need to update the package to the latest release, and then all is good. Um, yeah, so there's that. There's also um, uh, the uh there's also the idea that we can um, extend uh, uh, the tokens to themes so there's this concept of a token set um, and this is something we're currently uh, working on um, so we we finished the library website redesign now we're working on the film and television archive site um, and that's going to have a slightly uh, different look and feel and um, we can easily use the same components that are in the same component library um, and just change the token sets and have a completely different look and feel. So this is an example because um, the plugin itself is being buggy, but here's a, a video of, of how just like having a different set and toggling it on and off changes the aesthetic of, um, of, of a, a page. So um, you can think of it as themes, um, dark mode, light mode. Um, yeah, so that's that's our next step is to create a new set for the Film and Television Archive so that um, we can continue this, this process. Um, yeah, and another, another reason, another problem, um, here, I'll use our guides to just make fun of ourselves. But um, another reason for this is to not have like the million different colors that we don't actually use. So this is from our libguides um, and there's all, all of this uh, rainbow selection here, um, all the different fonts, all the different colors, um, all the variety that it's pulling from uh, the CSS. So if we go into the library site, um, you are, it's a little, it's less, right? You're getting, 
uh, a repeat of things, you're getting usage of variables instead of um, vary, like varying hex colors. Um, so it's cleaner, uh, it's easier to isolate and tar like figure out where the problem is. Um, and it's just, it's cleaner. There's, that's all of our typography. That's our, our entire scale. Um, where if we go to Git uh, or the, the lib guide, let's see, I'm just curious. Yeah, it like just goes on and on and on. Um, so uh, it's cleaner. I don't know. I like clean things. Um, and we can have nice things if we put the time into like figuring it out. Um, does anyone have any questions? I was just wondering what that website was. Oh, CSS stats. That's a, yeah, that's a great one. Is everyone going to like put their website on there now? What was it? Yeah, CSS stats. Yeah. yeah, here I can share. I'll share it in the chat. So just curious, Asha, you can hear the audience? Yes. Um, let's see. Okay, I just put it in the chat. Uh, Asha, can you hear me? Yes. Um, this is Nabil, actually. I don't know if you remember me from many moons ago. We um, overlapped in the ARL. IRL. Oh, hey! <laughs> now I'm based in LA. Um, oh, cool. You left Philly. Yeah, finally, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm having a flashback because many years ago, I would, uh, I think you gave a presentation about using SAS, and I, I was like, wow, this was like 10 years ago or something. Um, my question is, uh, I was a little unclear with the design tokens. Where is that also a place where you could put things like the minimal clickable areas, some of those more like nuanced mix-ins or those things that you have to define in the partial? So, um, so I have that in the um, in the in like a partial that I manually edit because it's that's never going to change unless the um, the WCAG standards change, um, but it's always going to be forty four. Um, so I like I would probably only put things as tokens if they're going to change, um, but uh, yeah, you could store it as a token in um, in that plugin if you want to, and just have it set as like minimal minimal uh, clickable area. So you could you could do that, um, but but we don't we don't do that yet. We just kind of have it as a separate file. Um, uh, this is Chad Nelson uh, from CDL. Um, I, uh, the system's awesome. Uh, I am totally impressed by it, but I'm also uh, cognizant that it's a, it's a system. It's a, it's a thing you got to maintain itself. And I wonder if you could talk about what that maintenance is like, like keeping all those pieces going and how often you have to do that. And then at what scale you think it actually becomes worth it to like have that kind of system in place. Because if you just have one, one uh, website, probably not worth it. But if you have, you know, a lot like you're talking about, then it probably does. And where do you see that trade off becoming uh, useful or kind of apparent? Yeah, I think um, even in the like, just focusing on the library website as the sole website for uh, the product that consumes this was um, helpful. Um, I, feel free to chime in uh, to developers. Uh, but um, it's, I think it's gonna, going to be immensely even more helpful as we extend it. So um, as we work on the film and television archive site, we'll use the same component library, but just alter the styling, right? So um, having a different token set will make this even more um, of uh, a helpful um, kind of process. And um, yeah, maintenance wise, uh, there are things um, like, like the plugin was kind of buggy today. So that's that's not great, but there are new um, new aspects of the tool. Let's see. There are now annotations, I think, built into this tool. So let's see. Yeah, there's like an annotate option. Um, that's based off of that. But I saw a annotation video. 
Mm, okay, so that's missing as well. But um, there are new features kind of being built into this tool. There's also a paid um, a paid level of this tool that provides more more options. Um, so uh, we we just use the free version and it is sufficient. But maintenance wise, we haven't really had to do too much um, because our tokens don't change much, right? We shouldn't be changing our brand because like very often it should be um, fairly consistent. But um, yeah, maintenance wise, I've had to update the actions because sometimes um, uh, certain tools need to be updated um, and things break and like they don't actually, a release doesn't get um, uh, made and then we're like wondering, oh, what happened? Like, why did this break? Um, but those are, those are very rare. It's happened only once. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Question? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Eddie. Kind of a follow up on his question. It sounds like you straddle design and engineering as like a tooling engineer. What is the size of the department or the structure between pure designers and the coders that you output um, these uh, uh, tokens to? Sure. So uh, uh, it's. Uh... Right now, it's a solo team of uh, uh, a US <laughs> team, but um, uh, in in the past, it was uh, two two designers, two UX designers, and um, we like depending if we include students or not. Um, uh, sometimes we have two students uh, uh, as UX designers as well, um, and then the apps team. There's um, three, four people, depending on, on the time and um, possibly in the future, student uh, developers, maybe. Um, but yeah, so not large. I don't think it's large, <laughs> but um, but we can, yeah, I don't know. It, to me, it, um, it helps. Like we do a lot of pairing. We don't, um, yeah, typically like the design to, the designer to developer handoff is still very waterfally. We work in a very agile env environment, and um, it doesn't really work so well. Even though you typically want to do the design work on, like upfront, right? Um, but uh, we do a lot of pairing with the developers, um, so it kind of helps us communicate what our intentions are, our design intentions. It also helps clarify, like, oh, if this is actually not be like capable of being built the way that we envisioned then we can re uh, go back to the drawing board. Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Jen, Ashton, Paranita, do you wanna say anything? Oh, great, great to use. I missed them, but thank you. Very helpful. Yeah, it's definitely easier than um, previously um, without that because you know, we, we didn't have to really do that much CSS component-wise until we got to page and then um, there's help there as well. Just to clarify, um, she's right, we have two UX designers, one's vacant, but just filled it, we have a new one starting at the end of the month. So these, these active two uh, plus the students and then the apps team, uh, we were operating with five on that team last year, we're down to three at the moment, but we will be back up to five in about a month. And Asha is a former developer, uh, right? So she's not afraid of the tooling. Uh, it's handy to have a designer who's fluent in development. All right, anyone else? Thank you, Asha. All right, thank you. Is it still recording? <laughs>